Welcome. Thanks for joining us today for the 11th webinar in our series, We Believe Experiences Matter. I'm Pamela Stafford gay Senior Marketing Manager at UserCentric, and I'll be moderating the presentation. Today, Gavin Liu will present, There is no such thing as user error. Managing Director of UserCentric, Gavin has been instrumental in designing innovative user experience research methods for medical device research. His extensive experience in human factors validation and FDA pre-market notification has resulted in presentations given at multiple national conferences on the topic. Gavin also serves as adjunct faculty member at both DePaul University and Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine, as well as lecture, lecturer on faculty at MCI Management Center Innsbruck. Assisting with today's presentation is Associate Director Corey Johnson, as an active member of the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, as well as the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society, Corey stays at the leading edge of constantly involving standards and FDA directives, and knows how to effectively incorporate human factors into a 510k submission. Before I hand this over to Gavin, if you have any questions during the presentation, use the GoToWebinar dashboard to send in your questions, and I'll compile them for the Q&A at the end of the presentation. I'll also be monitoring the chat window, so if there are technical issues, we'll try to address those as best we can. And if you can't stay for the full hour today, the recordings of all of our webinars are available on demand and can be accessed by visiting usercentric.com. One more thing, join the uh, discussion today on Twitter with the hashtag UXLunch. Take it away, Gavin. Hi there. Okay. So um, what I have to present today is a, it's a course called There is No Such Thing as User Error. Um, I'll kind of go through it, but in a briefly, I'm trying to move this mouse. It's coming. Here we go. Okay. Trying to show one slide. Just confirming everyone can see. Okay. Um, user-centric, just briefly, just to give everyone a sense for user-centric, we're founded in 99 with 50 full-time UX consultants, with most of us having graduate degrees in human factors, psychology, ethnography, and in general other human-computer interaction. Um, arguably our strongest experience area is the healthcare, with specific emphasis on medical devices and health information technology. Um, this talk is really about the search for what, what is called use errors. Not user errors, but use errors. So in my introduction, when we think about it, I want to really talk a little bit about the concept of error and how this works in the medical industry. Now, we have to recognize that no one wants to make a device that causes errors. Um, when we work in the field and we start to iterate and work with teams to define and develop products, no one really wants to make one that has errors. But errors do occur. So what is the process? What are the ways we can identify potential sources for error and do what we can to mitigate and, and control them? When we think of use errors, we think of, well, who are those that are usual suspects? Who are the ones that actually can create a use error? Really, these are the healthcare professionals. They are the nurses, the, the physicians, the nurse practitioners. They are the highly trained individuals that work on products that are designed for use in medical situations. So as designers of medical devices, we can never really think that being highly trained is going to solve the problem that a medical device could have. So a medical device that's poorly designed can't really fall back and say, you know, it's about, we, aren't these individuals smart? Aren't they highly trained? Can't they handle it? No, that's not the way we need to really think about things. And the reason for it is re, because even though HCPs are highly educated, often what we find is the tasks that they perform put them in this automatic mode, which makes them much more vulnerable to errors. So you can imagine that nurse doing rounds. As they go through it, their devices, the devices that they use, need to actually be able to provide assistance for them in the event that they get into an automatic mode where they actually can not create use errors because the device is smart enough and was designed well enough 
to prevent it. Um, when we think of healthcare professionals, sometimes we even overlook the pharmacists. What we're finding is that 51 million errors can occur each year, four, pharmacy, four per day, and for those who are actually developing products that pharmacists have to touch, that is to say dispense, fill, or integrate into a therapy, what we're finding is even as, as early as 2011, there was a human factor greatly recall based on what pharmacists do. So when I think about HCPs, well, what about patients? You know, where are the verbal kids of the world? What we're also seeing in the industry is that there are medical devices used by, used by healthcare professionals that are now being repurposed for use with patients. So you can imagine all the configuration screens, the areas of, that an expert, highly trained user will engage with. Now, what happens when you put that into a hand of a patient? And you don't really make major changes, but you're essentially repurposing it. I can see the business reason for it, but from a risk and safety perspective, there are high concerns. When we think about our patients, we have to recognize that our patients are an incredibly diverse population. They come with different education, experience, and literacy levels. That is always a challenge when we're designing a device. We also have to recognize that they are going to experience a wide range of training, well beyond what the manufacturer actually believes. We have to recognize that there may be no training. Many instances where people learn the first time when they actually are holding the device. We also have to realize that there are also different perspectives and contexts as well as environments that, that people are living in. It's not in a hospital setting. We, we have to are moving into people's living rooms. And these are what I call uncontrolled environments. So we have to consider dogs, younger children. I've been in situations where, where manufacturers have asked, well, why would that actually fall off the table? I mean, if, you, if you're all focused on these things, why would that happen? Understanding the perspective and context that the patients deal with in their home, if you can imagine younger children or even a dog running by, these are all the things that actually can happen, and it kind of takes us out of our pristine world of a lab where we can control many factors. And that's the challenge that we are all faced with because after a while, when you do this type of work long enough, you start to realize the diversity of this group is massive. And these are the areas and types of people that you need to use this, the devices you create and the treatment that's effective. What we also have to recognize is that even though it's an incredibly diverse group, should we really be blaming them? Are they the ones to shoulder the blame? And as we think about that, we come to our definition of what a use error is. A use error is, is something that a human does, but it's attributed to the design of the product. And that's really important because we want to distinguish human error or user error because both of those terms actually will place blame on the user as the cause of the failure and not the device. What we want to do is find ways to target deficiencies of the design and make remedies and design changes. And as all, all practices, when you think of a user-centered design methodology or iterative design, the earlier you find changes, the better. Okay? So we often focus on the device. Other things that you also need to focus that the FDA is concerned with is interaction with other devices and things. Technology is starting to converge. We're not just seeing a single device anymore. They are connecting to other devices. Those are areas for potential use error, as well as the instructions themselves. These are an area that need to be tested because we have found that instructions contribute to use errors. In an effort to improve patient safety, there's been a massive amount of focus on risk management. The healthcare industry is looking for risk management tools, and in this webinar I want to walk you through one of the tools. I think there's a pretty strong awareness of the importance that human factors plays in the design process. We're seeing this with the regulatory agencies. And what we want to do is simply drive human factors into the design sooner rather than later so we can affect a positive change. One of the tools is called the FMEA. It's a failure modes and effect analysis. 
it really it only answers a single question, and that is, if a system component fails, what is the effect on the system performance or safety? Okay. So when you think back, you know, what is the FMEA? I, I know a lot of engineers that tell me, oh, I know this in school, because it dates back to the 40s. You go back to military methods and procedures to identify risks in a very bottom-up manner. As technology began to advance into space exploration, nuclear power, risk amplified. So the need to identify and prioritize risk became important, and the FMEA became a very strong risk management tool. But the tool itself was designed around a system failure, and that usually meant engineering or material failure. So two examples are design FMEA, where as you can imagine in the automotive industry, you want to test all the components and subsystems during the manufacturing process. You want to identify to make sure that the materials are correct, accurate specifications. And then there's a the process. You also want to make sure that the process used to create this product is free of risk. Now what's of course interesting is when we talk about use error, the FMEA as traditionally built doesn't have the user in mind. It's all about manufacturing and materials. So there's a need to focus now on the user. So now if the system component fails, really what we're looking at is if a user commits an error, what is the effect on the system performance or safety? And as this diagram describes, lots of things can happen when a product is out in the hands of HCPs, in the hands of patients. There can be hazardous situations that occur. What this tool does is figure out the severity of harm with the probability or likelihood of it occurring to define what risk is. So risk really only has two parts, severity and probability. So to conduct an FMEA, I'm going to walk through some steps pretty briefly because oftentimes when we talk to a lot of our clients who, are, who need to perform an FMEA for the 510K validation, the engineering side is pretty well down. There are intuition as to how use errors can be documented. But there is a process that hasn't been that documented because there's not a lot of, of material on how a use error can be integrated into the FMEA. So in this talk, I'm going to describe some hybrids of different techniques out there and try to put it all together for me. So a user, a use error focused FMEA is, was really started in some ways by saying, let's take a task analysis. What do people have to do to complete what they're supposed to do? And start to assess what the risk associated with it. So Ed Israelsky and Bill Mudo in Pascal Carrion's recently published book, The Handbook of Human Factors and Ergonomics in Healthcare and Patient Safety. Um, it was, it's a second edition, and they made a chapter called Risk Management in Medical Products. It's a step-by-step -step process to identify hazards, specifically in medical devices. Um, one of the key areas that, they, that they're really advocating is, let's perform a task analysis. Let's not talk about how you construct it, or what if a material piece breaks? Let's talk about what people have to do in the task analysis. And what does this tell us about their behaviors? What can we predict from there? And what possible use errors can occur? Before I get into the process, I want to show you what an FMEA could look like. Um, there's a table here. Um, now, recognize there are many different styles to this, but ultimately, it is really a table. It's a table used by the team to document and work through issues, as well as has colors to pull attention to specific rows. So the purpose here is to document what could happen, whether it's highly likely or very low probability, whether it has a very catastrophic harm or it could have negligible harm, but to document everything. The purpose behind this is to have a very strong document that covers and anticipates as many problems and hazards that you could, uh, you could imagine. And then it assesses the risk level associated with it, and then comes up with risk measures. Because what you want to do is when you identify a potential hazard, you want to come up with a risk control, some way to mitigate it, some way to eliminate. And this is where we talk about design changes, ways to make the design smarter 
so that the hazard that could occur, dust, which then can be assessed of how effective it is, and ultimately can tell you how safe or how risky your product is. And in this, in this particular case, the far right row describes the color. Those, those areas that remain to be high risk and those that have been mitigated because of design changes. The step-by-step -step process that Israelski and Mudo provide is 12, 12 steps. The first step is to form a team. And this team is a really cross-functional team. It includes a great deal of team members, from regulatory to product, member, to product teams, those from medical affairs, training. If training is a part of this, you want representation from training, quality assurance, as well as those in the user group. Just because you may have had a degree in practice 10, 15 years ago, doesn't necessarily mean that you have the experience and context of somebody who's presently working in the practice. So that's why you should bring user group representatives to the meeting as well to get their input. On this meeting, all you're doing is agreeing upon the goals and procedures, and then you're actually going to conduct a task analysis. This can be provided to the team beforehand. A task analysis, for those who aren't as um, really aware of the human factors piece of it is, let's take a step away from the device that you're testing, and let's talk about documenting the step-by-steps and decisions that have to be made to complete tasks. And these are the tasks that typically are performed, whether it's configuration or, an, or administration of a drug or, or checking maintenance. Those are all steps that can be documented, in some ways, independent of the device. Tell us what goes through the user's mental model. Okay? So what happens here is what you want to do is you don't want to do the task analysis and then brainstorm. So one really good technique is for a team to provide a task analysis based on the instructions for use and then bring that into the group and then present it, as opposed to trying to do a task analysis and brainstorm at the same time. What's going to happen is you're going to really get distracted and ultimately you're going to become very device focused. You're not going to become focused on what the user's decisions are because you're looking right at the device. And we have to recognize that sometimes decisions are made when a device is still in somebody's purse or if it's still inside the refrigerator. Okay? So the team is really going to focus on the user, the use environment, generate use errors. But the task analysis is a framework that can be presented to this meeting. Okay? The third step is to begin the worksheet. Settle the team on format and columns. Um, lots of ways to do it. You can have large sheets of paper. Ultimately, one, one way we like to use is actually to put it up in a projector and you have a scribe. We are constantly adding to this as a team begins to brainstorm. What this will do is facilitate group interactions and actually break out more roles in the, in the task analysis and inside the, the FMEA. So the fourth step is actually begin to, to potential, you know, to think of brainstorm. What are potential use errors? What are the failure modes we can come up with? Typical brainstorming rules apply. We really want to facilitate ideation, identification of new use errors as opposed to debating whether something really is a use error or not. Whether something has low probability or something you shouldn't worry about. Let's document. Okay? What you're going to do is you might need to break up into subgroups because oftentimes you will go off on tangents. One use error will beget others. Maybe a subgroup can go talk about those. So if you take a look at the actual rows, there the first row is, a, is maybe a task, which could be a site set up. Identify the use error, and then from there, you start to build out the rest of the columns. As you go through the task, which are elements of your task analysis, you're going to blow out more rows because, for example, when you have to remove X, such as it says in 1.1, there may be multiple issues that could come up with that, and you'll blow out extra rows. Once you have brainstormed a large chunk of these, the next step is to also apply them on a device. I know this sounds really silly, but the amount of times we have seen FMEAs occur based solely on instructions, intuition, and memory because the device has not yet been built or it's still in production, 
is enough to be concerned. And I know that I'm talking with the FDA, this sometimes has come up as, as an issue as well. It sounds silly. Do everything you can to have a device, even if it's a prototype device, you can hold in your hand as you brainstorm. Okay? Also look to data that you have for your MDRs or customer complaints. An excellent source of ways to help the team brainstorm. Once you have brainstormed, you'll start to begin the process on the third column, which is let's start talking about what could happen if, this, if something happened. What is the potential harm? What's the potential effect? As you go do this, similar to how use errors beget other use errors, you may find that there are harms that have a cascading effect. Address the worst case scenarios at the top and the, the, the lower harm cases at the bottom. So again, we're breaking more and more rows out of the FMBA to talk about, well, someone could really do this, or they might do these three other things. Prioritize them from worst case in terms of harm. So they can, the, the highest harm, potential for harm, can always be addressed first. Following the identification of a hazard, you then want to understand what the severity is. So what you want to do is assign a level of severity. Now, as you can see in this example, there's catastrophic to critical, all the way down to negligible. There are lots of ways to do this. Here's an ISO standard, 14971, and it's actually an append, um, it's called the Annex E, and it presents a table of qualitative severity levels. So you can go from catastrophic, that it could result in patient death, to something that's negligible. So what you see here is a qualitative way of doing it, and you can assign a number to it. It's got five levels. Alternatively, you could look at a three-level design, severe, moderate, and negligible. Those also fit in ISO 14971. Um, as we go through this, I'm going to actually reference that ISO standard quite a bit because it does provide a way to understand risk levels, both in terms of severity as well as probability, that can be used to help everyone assign risk levels and tolerances that we can live with. The next column that we look at once we understand the severity is how likely is this actually going to happen. Now, this is an interesting one. Very similar, you can use five qualitative measures, such as frequent to improbable. Um, looking at the ISO standard again, there are actually quantitative or semi-quantitative probability levels that can go from frequent to improbable. Um, what we have to recognize is these numbers, arguably, might be hard to come up with. Okay. So what happens is, historically, you will look to data that you can find from experimental data, expert judgment, or simulation techniques. Oftentimes what we see a lot of is to move away from the semi-quantitative mode to coming up with a more of a qualitative perspective. Okay. Now, here's kind of the situation. When you think of the probability, you must try to understand all of the potential situations circumstances, and the full sequence of events that can create harm. Okay? So as you go through this, think about does the hazardous situation occur in absence of a failure? What other things need to happen in, for this fault to occur? Or will this hazard situation only occur if multiple faults in the process occur? So there are multiple ways that, that the device has circuit breakers, so to speak. Those are all ways to help your team identify probability. Okay? As you go down this, what you wanted to also do is relate this all to the estimated number of, of devices in the market. This goes with the ISO standard, which has lots of documentation on how you, your team can come up with these ratings and which, team, which type of ratings your team agrees upon. Okay? The next slide talks about the multiplication of risk by probability, and to form a risk prioritization number. Simply, you could literally do catastrophic as a 5, frequent as a 5, and you multiply the two together. It's just one way to prioritize risk. There are many ways to do it. Following the prioritization of risk, there is a risk evaluation matrix. Here is one of them in, ISO, in the same ISO standard, and what you want to look at here 
is recognize that the regulators pay special attention to catastrophic harm, almost regardless of P. The reason is because, in all honesty, manufacturers can lowball the likelihood of risk. So what happens here is, even though you may have a remote or improbable chance, it is something that will be highly scrutinized by regulatory agencies. It's not something that can be overlooked. You need to explain and justify what control measures you put in to handle this. So ultimately, you've got a risk prioritization. Take a look at risk evaluation matrices such as this to think about how you want to mitigate risk and also recognize where the microscope will be focused. Once you prioritize these, you'll start to identify areas that need to be addressed immediately and those that may not require any action. Next steps are really to think about how you can eliminate and reduce the risk. What are the risk control mechanisms? So when I think of risk control mechanisms, I think back to a movie called, called War Games, where at the beginning of the movie, um, these two soldiers drive their truck in the, in the dead of winter, it seems like a blizzard, and they walk into this house because it's essentially a missile silo, and they're controlling it. Okay? So they walk into the missile silo, it's a very cool opening scene for those who've seen it, and when I think about ways to control, the, the ways to design can be controlled where someone can't accidentally do something. You have your two characters here. Um, there's, there's actually the West Wing star on the far right, and he was pretty skeptical about what happens when they receive a message to, to essentially launch the missiles, and he's pretty hesitant to turn his key. What we're looking at is a design where two people are required to do something. So one person can actually spill their coffee and flip the switch. There needs to be a control mechanism where two people are involved. And ultimately, the guy who eventually has Kill Bill fame and other, other uh, Reservoir Dogs type movies, he tries to get the West Wing star to turn his key because the design control really presented a challenge that he could not complete his task. When we think about this, what I really want to make everyone aware of is potentially dangerous actions should require more effort, similar to that um, movie opening. What we want to do is mitigate use errors and improve patient safety. That's really the key here. Um, there is a practice out there that medical device manufacturers may say, such as it's as low as reasonably practical. Um, honestly, recognize that there is a, a trade-off between the practical limit of cost with regulatory. Regulatory agencies see this as a cop-out. Because you must justify and just describe the burden of cost, of cost, the tolerability of risk, they want to see controls. And the controls basically make it hard for users to do something wrong and make it easier for them to do something right. It's that simple. I know there's lots of justification as to why something may cost too much. And you get into the let's repurpose a device used by healthcare professionals and put it into the home care environment. But we're walking down a very scary path, and that path has risk associated with it. So when you look at device safety, what you want to do is you want to eliminate the potential hazard. You can either do this by reducing the severity or probability. So what can you really do? What protective measures, what safeties, what alarms can you put in? And the arrow down there describes the varying importance. And that means putting labels and instructions are not as strong risk mitigators as one would think. You can't just put a sticker on there or a little card insert and say, please don't do this. There are other ways to make the device more safe, where a person has to actually take a positive action to remove something. So you at least have a little bit more of a semblance that something was looked at. Or better yet, create a design that already has the risk control mechanism inherent inside it so the users can't make that error. Okay? Which ultimately creates a risk priority and your risk acceptability that will be looked at by regulators in your 510K. Now, taking an FMA further is to really 
think about the 12 steps and in some ways take a practical aspect of it. What we found is that a lot of this occurs from brainstorming. What you actually find is that a lot of this happens inside a closed office environment, such as a boardroom. And as I mentioned before, sometimes it happens without a device. So this is where it happens. This is where FMEAs tend to happen. They're not, they may not be in the ICU. It may not be in somebody's home environment. So one addition is to conduct your FMEA in a simulated environment. Um, this is a, this is your pictures taken from the Sim Lab at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine, where we can talk about in the bottom right and the bottom examples being applying this device in a neonatal environment. Your product teams and subject matter experts can talk about having smaller gauge equipment. But when you look at all of the equipment around there and as people are, are engaging, moving and fumbling to some extent and finding and tracing all of the different equipment that's connected to this patient, this is where you start to see more ideas come in terms of brainstorming, more potential hazards that may not even be associated with your device, but understanding these hazards and addressing them go a long way in demonstrating that you've actually thought through what use errors could occur. And actually see on the upper left, um, you see one of the, um, the employees actually painting a wound. Because sometimes we forget that the actual target site, the, um, the area, may be difficult to get to. And how will this device actually fit in all different positions? These are things that you may not see in a boardroom, but when you see a mannequin, when you see equipment around you and pumps moving, you actually start to consider other potential ideas that can come from there. So the concept here is maybe not necessarily to compose all the brainstorming, but to simply review the FMEA that you've built in the simulated environment. Walk through the rows of your FMEA as you go through this. You're also going to have access to all the equipment that you can see there. So you can see Dr. Vaz looking at, on the upper right, he's looking at some data that's coming out. You can see whether the data is going to support or help or confuse the other issues. You can think of lots of ways that your device will be interacting with other things. Also recognize that you may need, similar as I described before, to break off a team if you come up with a set of errors that are new when you are reviewing inside a simulated use environment. Break off a sub-team and let the main team continue down the list. What, we, what I want you to take away from this is the FMEA is really a risk, risk management tool. It starts with the task analysis. <clears throat> By adding simulated environments, you can increase the number of use errors that you find as well as uh, precision. And the goal here is not necessarily create an FMEA the first time but through the process towards a 510K application, you get smarter and you add to the FMEA. So this is in some ways a living document up until when the 510K submission is provided. The, 510, uh, the FMEA is very useful because if you uncover things in formative research, hazard risks, add it to the FMEA. Or if you do see a, a use error that is part of the FMEA in the validation study, or in informative research, which you then can do is relay it back to the FMEA and actually start to create risk mitigation controls, as well as understand that, that sometimes use errors happen, but the harm was negligible and the likelihood was low. So you actually will use the FMEA to, to essentially assess the risk that you found in subsequent re research inside validation or inside formative. So what you want to do is evolve it as you go from exploratory to validation and move forward with this tool in hand because this is just one of many pieces that will compose the F510K validation or pre-market approval and in some ways it really will tell the regulatory agencies that you've done as much as you can and taken the steps necessary to understand what will happen when your device is out there in the marketplace. 
Um, I'm going to leave this up here for a moment. It's a number of references that were used to compose this presentation. Um, specifically, it's ISO 14971, as well as a number of other articles. So those who want to take a screenshot, please do so. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to questions and answers. Okay. So I, um, shall I read the question? Okay. Um, some questions that have come up um, during the presentation is, the first one is, what is the difference between performing a task analysis and brainstorming with the group to identify opportunities for use error? Don't they result in the same outcome? What we're seeing here is um, what we want to do is break out the task analysis and the brainstorming. When you're brainstorming, what I want everyone to do is really kind of take the, um, the PCA route, which is really to think through what, is, what could happen, what are the cognitive activities, what are the actions. So what do people perceive? What do they see? What do they think about? What's the cognition and how do they act? So it's perception cognition and action. Those subsets that start to form the task analysis, that allows you to put a little bit more rigor around a simple brainstorming activity. That amount of rigor will allow your team to get more use errors and identify more use errors, more use errors out of this. Um, the next one. Um, how do you estimate the probability of the use error? Isn't it arbitrary? And the answer is that actually, in some ways, it is arbitrary. Um, not a lot of teams are able to truly do the quant analysis that's necessary. So um, by quant analysis, what I mean by that is the post-market surveillance. Um, so the AE reports, if you have those, if you have MDRs, then you can actually go into there and get that type of data relative to the amount of devices in the marketplace. You can also look to subject matter experts interviews as you start to move from the quants or semi-quantitative scale of determining probability to field observations to simulated use testing. Ultimately, try to justify why you came up with it, provide the pros, and then you have to move forward from there. It is, if you don't have the data, it can be arbitrary. But if you can base it on interviews, field observations, simulated use testing, and survey data, that will really help you. Um, do you want to read this to me? Yeah, think about it. Uh, should subteams have representation for all function areas found in the FMEA gathering? I would really recommend that. Um, so, so, the, so the question is, should how you know the, when you think about should subteams have representation from functional areas? What what we found is that the subteams who break off have they have a they, they have a knowledge of this area. So you typically will see um, somebody who is a practitioner, a, a healthcare professional. You'll also see someone from training because that's where in some ways where the rubber meets the road, and you'll probably have someone from the product team present. Um, when a team meets, it's hard enough to get all representation, let alone have N plus 1. So, you know, you recognize that the full team will probably only have its complement of one person um, from each area. And so if the sub-team needs to break off, I would have representation from at least the subject matter experts, which would be healthcare professionals. I would bring in a member of the product team as well as a training area, because so, there may be risk mitigation that needs to go into training, as, or at least documentation. The product team area can handle the design or product changes, and the healthcare professional can ideate with you and, and continue the brainstorming exercise. So that would be the bare minimum that I would try to take from there, if you can. But usually what you'll form is those four groups kind of form naturally, because they tend to have the most impact with regard to things. Yeah, keep going. Okay. Um, if a company uses an FTA approach for their software risk analysis, is it worth separating use error analysis using an FMEA approach rather than using FTA or If you, you know, it's it's ultimately you've, if you've done already the work for that, I would keep the FTA. Um, what I would then do is, and this is where you start to see the gray area of these risk mitigation tools. You can't help but include some use error 
in some of these, some of the other ways to do things. What you'll want to do then is to do an FMEA that's a use related, that's specific to that, and try to tease out and use as initial rows. Take out some information from your FTA and pull it over. What I really appreciate with a use focused, a user, a use focused um, FMEA is that you're really working from more than just a task analysis. You're including the whole complement of the team there. And as you start to work through that, that level of rigor will usually uncover a few more nuggets. Um, so I don't want to reinvent the wheel, but I do want to respect that there are some elements of rigor that will achieve a greater number of brainstormed ideas. And hopefully as you brainstorm ideas, what that ultimately does is it creates the justification and importance to create a, a risk mitigation control. So sometimes teams don't necessarily want to make a design change for one in, I, one issue. Even sometimes if it has a severe harm, what you'll find is that if you can find multiple harms because of this, because you've done a very good FMEA, everyone kind of looks at the red table and says there's really no way we, we can live with ourselves by launching a product like this until we start putting more controls in. And you start to see change happen internally. Yes? Um, should all usability testing in the medical field be covered by cells in the FMEA? Is it the starting point for any usability tests? Um, so let me read. Should all usability testing in the medical field be covered by cells in the FMEA? Oh, I see what you're saying. So I interpret this question to be, if you do a task analysis, the rows start off with, what are the things that the user has to do? Ultimately, those can be things that are tasks in the usability test. Um, and I mentioned that a task could be configure the device for first use. A task could be perform an injection or administer medicine. Those kind of tasks, as you go through all the things to prepare the site, to prepare the device, to administer the medication, to post administer activities, those should be things that usability te that are part of your usability tests. If you had to, took the time to, to do a task analysis, if you took the time to say these are something the users will do, these are things that should be in the usability tests, which is the formative or exploratory research, I say most definitely. And what you then do is when you find a potential error that's made by a user, You'll then look to the FMEA to see if this use error, what impact it has. So there's a, there's, you definitely go back and forth between what the usability test and the FMEA is, is our testing. Those, I'll tell you, the usability test will probably uncover a couple unanticipated use errors that you'll have to add to the FMEA, but I see the FMEA as a strong base for the tasks in usability testing which will then be your task and validation. Okay? Um, very good. Are there any more questions? Um, there is one final question that says here, where do you draw the line between mitigating a use error by putting in design control and mitigating the use error by implementing training or adding content? Um, what's really interesting here is you're always going to lean on the task analysis to have an understanding of who is likely to commit the use error and the context of use. Um, what you're going to find is that you know if a use error could be committed by these expert users or healthcare professionals, what we're ha what we recognize is that these experts, and they don't always have to be HCPs, they also could be expert patients. Uh, for example, when we do auto-injection devices, sometimes those diabetic patients who inject themselves every day, who, are, who consider themselves experts, are often those that don't look at instruction for use. So while you may believe that a mitigation control can simply be adding content to the IFU, recognize that as you go through this, your expert users are those who are less likely to read an instruction for use. So if your mitigation control lies there, that may not be good enough. It may be insufficient. Where you actually may need to actually change the device, mark or label the device, 
so that both aspects are there. Those who have novice to intermediate training, they may use the IFU, but having marking and having a device that has the procedures or, tick, or, or steps that potentially mitigate those risks, that's a good thing for, for those. And the expert users who only rely on the device and their memory and all their prior training, those, those changes you make to the device will help them there. So understand the context of use. Put it into your simulated use training because oftentimes you'll never really know for sure which way to go. Well, you've got rounds of formative testing. You've got a validation round. Do it. Implement these contexts of use. See what happens when you do your formative research. See whether the, the, the controls that you've put in eliminate not only confusion, but actual the actions of the use errors. Okay. So what you want to do is to truly make it a device have both changes to the IFU and the device, recognizing that the IFU in some ways is a last ditch change. Change things earlier, change things to the device itself. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, they're still coming. <laughs> okay, but um, but overall, thanks everyone for attending. I will make a recording of this presentation available on SlideShare, YouTube, and Vimeo, as well as links to the usercentric.com website. Okay. Um, there will be a tweet when it's live. Okay. So hope everyone enjoyed it and thank you.